Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life program. My name is Tracy Bowman. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a very proud UM alumna. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you everyone for joining us today and making this event part of your day. We are able to offer this program free of charge to all of our alumni and friends around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of our affinity partner, IE Financial Group. Many thanks to them. You can learn more about the insurance options that are available to alumni also on our alumni website. So before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping details. Today's session, as per usual, is being recorded. Uh, and to follow this, we will be sending you a link to the session so you're able to view it a number of times again, as well as share with friends and family. All of our sessions from the past 15 months are on our website. There's lots of great content content, well over 30 sessions. So we encourage you to go there as many times as you'd like to see all of those sessions. We also sent you a link to Slido and the password. That is the platform we use uh, to take questions from our audience. So that is slido.com and the password is VLFL21. So I encourage you to actually bring up a, another page on your browser so you can just log right in. So as soon as a question comes to your mind during the presentation, you're able to ask that right away and I'll be monitoring that in the background. Please ask as many questions as you'd like and we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, over this next hour. So now I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Annette Demare on the topic of why does food sovereignty matter? Now, let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Demare is a Canada Research Chair in Human Rights, Social Justice, and food sovereignty. She's the author of La Vieille Compensina, Globalization and the Power of Peasants in 2007, that was published in French, Spanish, Korean, Italian, and Portuguese. She's also co-edited Food Sovereignty, Reconnecting Food, Nature, and Community in 2010, and Food Sovereignty in Canada, Creating Just and Sustainable Food Systems in 2011. Now, prior to obtaining her doctorate in geography, she was a small-scale cattle and grain farmer in Canada for about 14 years. Uh, and she's also worked as technical support for the organization I mentioned earlier for a decade and continues to conduct participatory research with member organizations of this transnational agrarian movement. So with that, over to you, Dr. Demare. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I apologize in advance for the, um, the, the not so great camera. Um, I'm doing this over the phone uh, because we had some technical problems with uh, computers. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of this series for inviting me uh, to speak to you today on why does food sovereignty matter? Now, um, the recurring food crisis and climate change and the growing awareness of the actual public uh, disaster caused by the global food system clearly highlight the need for alternatives. And they're more, the pre, uh, alternatives are actually more pressing than ever. Um, and the global land grab that has captured millions of hectares around the world is yet another expression of the dispossession that's caused by this dominant model of rural development that we have. Um, yet another, of course, is the persistent number of um, hungry people living in the world. The overwhelming majority of them who live in the countrysides of the world. But the question is then, what does a radical alternative look like in this current context? We can call it a rad radical or we can call it common sense. Either way, it's gotta be transformatory. That is the alternatives that we work on must aim to transform the existing and unjust social and political structures and relations that we've established. And this means that the alternatives need to tackle really important issues like wealth, 
impoverishment, that is the processes that make people poor. And of course, we need to tackle power. So many people argue that food sovereignty is one such alternative and that it actually represents pathways through, through that lead us to socially just and ecologically sustainable food systems. But what the question is then, what is food sovereignty? What is it that makes it such a powerful and revolutionary idea? And how do communities actually engage in food sovereignty? Well, I, what I want to do today is address these questions by exploring some definitions of food sovereignty and then talking about two concrete cases of food sovereignty in action. And the first case is the, the Via Capsina itself. Uh, and I want to talk about the Via Capsina, the social actor that gifted the world uh, this idea of food sovereignty, uh, because it seems to me that um, by looking at that movement, we get a much, much better sense of what food sovereignty is all about and why it matters. That's the first case. The second case I want to talk about is women's struggles for equity, for equality within the Via Campesina. So um, can I have uh, someone move the slide, please? OK, so what exactly is food sovereignty in a nutshell? and certainly at the risk of simplification, food sovereignty is the right of peoples and nations to control their own food and agricultural including their own market, their food culture, and environments. Now this really, really concise definition, of course, only hints at the complexities involved in food sovereignty. And when the Via Campesina first introduced the idea of food sovereignty at the World Food Summit held in Rome in 1996, they did so as a counterforce to the increased globalization of a neoliberal model of agriculture that was leading to increasing displacement, dispossession, and impoverishment in the countryside. It was a model that was devastating rural landscapes around the world, and most importantly, it was a model that was really um, gearing uh, or geared to the extinction of peasant agriculture, small scale agriculture. And it was also geared to the ex extinction of peasants themselves. Um, can I have the other slide, please? So instead, what the Vietnam Sina did was at that time, in 1996, they proposed food sovereignty as a way of building a future without hunger. And it, this, this idea uh, rested on uh, seven key principles. First, that food must be considered, first and foremost, a basic human right. Uh, food sovereignty necessitated the redistribution of resources, so uh, of food producing resources, so agrarian reform was absolutely fundamental. It was also um, based uh, on the idea that you absolutely needed to protect uh, all natural resources. It required a fundamental reorganizing of, organize, uh, of agricultural trade so that we would be talking about uh, fair trade instead of uh, a, a market-based uh, global agricultural trade that was not favorable at all to small-scale farmers. Another key principle was that the goal of the development model was to end global hunger. Uh, two other principles that were key were the establishing of social peace and lastly that food sovereignty is fundamentally based on democratic control of the food system the next slide please so by introducing this idea this this revolutionary idea of food sovereignty 
what the Vietnam did was actually shift the turns of the debate by moving it away from just talking about food security uh, and uh, to, to talking about food sovereignty. Now, this shift um, was significant because as Nettie Weeb here explains, she was the former um, uh, president of the National Farmers Union here in Canada, food sovereignty was our way of differentiating our agenda from the liberalized agenda. And it was also a way to introduce a much more complex set of ideas about what it really meant to be food secure, which included political power, ideas about who control resources and who has access to resources and who gets to control their own production and their own consumption. So what Nettie is stressing here is is, is the Viet Cina's determination to politicize food systems. And this is the fundamental difference between food security and food sovereignty, because food sovereignty politicizes food systems. So what do we mean when we say that? What does it mean to politicize food systems? And why does this matter? Well, rather than just conforming to a corporate model of agriculture, you know, that, that really tried to make us all believe that the only way we can feed the world is to engage in large-scale industrial agriculture. And, by, and in doing that, you constantly focus on increasing production, but you also specifically increase that production for export. So by introducing food sovereignty, the Via Campesina was shifting the discussion to understanding power relations and the politics of food systems. So the next slide, please. So that is, but by arguing, as the Via Campesina did, that we have the right to produce our own food in our own territory, the Via Campesina was saying that food sovereignty focuses squarely on issues related to what food is produced and harvested, that is, what kind of food is produced and harvested, who produces it, who harvests it, where and how is it produced and gathered, and really so important, at what scale is that food produced? And that all of these questions they argued, were, are as important as ensuring adequate and accessible amounts of food. So essentially, food sovereignty entails designing food systems that keep small-scale producers on the land and able to make a living from growing food. It's a model of production, a model of distribution and consumption that is environmentally sustainable and fundamentally socially just. And, and I, I have to say here, when I talk about a system, a food system being socially just, um, it, this means that it's a model of agriculture and food that involves the equitable distribution of access to and control over resources. This means access to and control over food producing resources, such as seeds, water, land, but, it, but also, um, and also importantly, it considers decision-making power as a key resource. So it means giving ordinary citizens the right and obligation to participate in decision-making around food. So in essence, food sovereignty seeks to put the control of the food system back into the hands of ordinary people. So by introducing food sovereignty, the Via Campesina was prompting people to debate, to get into debates about and, and, and issues and questions about who was making all these really important decisions about food and agriculture. And of course, uh, whose interests were, were being served. So in many ways then, many people argue that food sovereignty is actually best understood as a radical democratic product uh, project that on the one hand exposes the power dynamics within the current global food system 
But then on the other hand, food sovereignty creates all kinds of new spaces, you know, at all levels, whether it's in a public school, a university, a municipal council, a national government. It creates all kinds of spaces for inclusive debate on a whole set of different issues related to food, agriculture, and provisioning. So the next slide, please. So as the food sovereignty movement expanded beyond those involved in just the Via Campesina, and, I, and I'm going to explain the Via Campesina in a bit, um, the global and um, food that was held in Neleni uh, in Mali, that was held in 2007, it was truly a, an important turning point for food sovereignty. And I say this for three main reasons. First, it was a form that successfully brought new social movements, new social actors like fishers, pastoralists, and urban-based movements into the fold, and thus expanded, um, or it, it helped shift food sovereignty to, to spread beyond just rural spaces. Secondly, with the entry of new social actors, the global movement then expanded food sovereignty to go beyond just production, but to, to focus a little bit more on consumption and also access to food issues. And thirdly, the follow-up to that event um, was quite phenomenal because what happened was a lot of the people who went to Neleni then came back home and used the food sovereignty framework to build new or strengthen existing national food movements. And a really good example of that actually is the strengthening of uh, Food Secure Canada that occurred um, uh, after Neleni. And you know, also other examples are um, the expanding food sovereignty movements in Europe and the United States. So those who participated in the, in the Neleni um, reached consensus on probably what is uh, now become the best known um, definition of uh, food sovereignty as resting on six pillars. And that is, um, they're on the right of, of the slide there, it, that food sovereignty focuses on food for peoples uh, as opposed to food for machines. Uh, it values food producers. It localizes uh, food systems. It puts the control of food at the local level. It builds knowledge uh, and skills and it works with nature rather than trying to control nature. And what's really interesting is that in Canada, um, a seventh pillar, remember I mentioned the Food Secure Canada? Well, within Food Secure Canada, there was a really active Indigenous circle. And as a, it was a result of their participation, their contribution, that the Canadian food, um, food movement included a seventh pillar. And that is sacred, please. Um, so the late um, Catherine Neen, who was the former leader of Food Secure Canada, she summed it up um, as follows. If food is sacred, it cannot be treated as a mere commodity, manipulated into junk foods and, and taken from people's mouths to feed animals or vehicles. If the ways in which we get food are similarly sacred, Mother Earth cannot be enslaved and forced to produce what we want when and where we want it through our technological tools. And if food is sacred, the role of those who provide food is respected and supported. So, but you know, what do these definitions, the next, uh, explanations, um, do they actually do justice to what food sovereignty is all about, to its potentials? Does it, do these definitions talk to or uh, you know, show us um, or point to the challenges, the limitations of food sovereignty? 
I think that to really better understand food sovereignty, we have to look carefully at the social actors involved. And I say that because understanding how food sovereignty emerged helps us gain a much more nuanced understanding of what it's all about. After all, concepts that are really um, revolutionary in that they really lead to social change, they often do not appear in a vacuum kind of as disembodied intellectual exercises. Instead, let's remember that food sovereignty is a deeply, deeply grounded idea. Uh, it embodied initially in the very lives and struggles of farmers and peasants, rural women, indigenous peoples and farm workers in the global north and the global south. And then it became the concept, the idea was then later on reworked somewhat in interaction with uh, urban based movements. Now this embodiment in the day to day struggles of both urban and rural uh, world based uh, movements, I think, much more potential to succeed. And of course, it also makes it much more complex. So I want to shift now to talking about my very, the first uh, case study uh, of food sovereignty in action. I want to do that by focusing on specifically on the Via Campesina. Next slide, please. So the Via Campesina emerged uh, in 1993 out of a meeting of about 45 representatives of farm organizations in the, in the North and the South. Now, it is a transnational agrarian movement that brings together 182 organizations from 81 countries in uh, Europe, the Americas, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East and North African region. It's estimated that they represent over 200 million people, and it is now considered by many to be the world's largest and most powerful transnational agrarian movement. Now, it was at the Via Campesina's second international conference um, held in uh, April of 1996 in Taxcala, Mexico, that peasants and farmers from the global north and global south committed themselves once again to struggle together for the right to exist as uh, peasants and farmers and uh, to exist as small scale farmers. In doing so, they collectively imagined this powerful counter narrative to large scale corporate led agriculture. What they were doing was imagining a socially just, rights based, ecologically sustainable future based on food sovereignty. So how is it that they were able to do that? <laughs> I want to stress that um, it is the North-South collaboration that occurred in this second in international conference in Mexico that has, con that has continued throughout the Via Campesina's trajectory that makes what food sovereignty is all about. As, as one of the people that was assigned to take notes and summarize the results of those all day and late night discussions in Taxcala, in Rome, and various other meetings of the Via Campesina, I can tell you that Via Campesina organizations took great, great care to, to really try to understand each other's realities, to develop uh, an alternative vision that reflected the interests and needs of food producers in the North, in the Global North, and in the glo Global South. So, you know, that is whether or not it was uh, the entry of genetically modified organisms, um, the building of a chicken or pig factory, a, a corporate land grab, a mining company contaminating water sources, et cetera. The Via Campesina recognized that each one of those struggles particular place in a given meeting. But they also acknowledge that each of those struggles on its own might not seem that significant, uh, except, of course, to those who were immediately affected. 
But what the Via Campesina did so well was to establish connections between those struggles and to establish solidarity relations between the social actors involved in these local um, place-based struggles. What the Via Campesina worked so hard at doing was to establish what people had in common. And, I, and in this case, they agreed on the need for a different food future. And as Rafael Alegria, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, as Rafael Alegria, who was the former operational secretariat of the Via Campesina, told me in an interview, he said, I think that what makes, um, that, that what really unites us is a fundamental to humanism, because the S is individual and materialism. The common problems of land production, technology markets, ideological formation, training, poverty, etc. all of these we have in common. But what also unites us are great aspirations. We are all convinced that the current structures of economic, political, and social power are unjust and exclusionary. What unites us is a spirit of transformation and struggle to change these structures all over the world. We aspire to a better world, a more just world, a more humane world, a world where real equality and social justice ex exist. These aspirations and solidarity in rural struggles keep us united in the Via Campesina. Now, of course, the, uni the unity that Rafael talks about was not automatically established. It was years in the making as peasants or peasant organizations in the Via Campesina exchanged ideas and experiences and debated amongst themselves. They compromised they, and ultimately reached consensus. And as they did so, um, can you go to the next slide, please? As they, as they did that, they also worked at certainly consolidating a collective identity as people of the land, as peasants, as small-scale farmers. They worked at carving spaces for internal debate and voicing their demands in national and international arenas. They were making strategic decisions about when to engage and when to disengage in negotiations with powerful um, organizations, powerful forces. They engaged in direct action and mobilization around the world. And importantly, they also concentrated on building alliances with other social movements and non-governmental organizations. To me, it's really remarkable that the Via Campesina emerged, that it succeeded in carving out a political space at the international level. They were doing this in a context where many continued to argue that peasants and peasant agriculture no longer mattered and that in fact, it shouldn't exist. The next slide, please. So it is quite remarkable. It's quite remarkable that against all, all odds, not only is this movement continuing to exist, it is growing in numbers and influence. There is certainly much evidence uh, that food sovereignty has gained momentum as it continues to be embraced by many movements around the world, by non-governmental organizations and academics who have more recently joined uh, the fold. And this is very, very clear by the revival of interest that we see in peasant studies and critical agrarian studies. Now you find academic journals in a wide range of fields and disciplines ranging from geography, anthropology, political science, food studies, philosophy, and science that are you know, talking about um, uh, various elements of food sovereignty. There is also a vibrant and growing indigenous food sovereignty uh, literature and movement. And meanwhile, large international scientific studies argue the validity of food sovereignty. And importantly, after a 20 year struggle, the Via Campesina's food sovereignty model is now backed by a number of rights 
articulated in the new International Declaration of the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas, the UNDROP. And that was a declaration that was officially recognized by the UN in December of 2018. So it is because of the Via Campesina that peasants are now back on the map in international deliberations of rural development and a new model of rural development is being debated around the world. Can I have the next slide, please? So in many ways, it was in developing its concept of food sovereignty that the Via Campesina reached this unity within diversity that Rafael Alegria was talking about. And this was the result of a whole lot of hard work uh, and invention. Through numerous south to south, uh, south to north, north to north exchanges among peasants and farmers, the Via Campesina established the connections between these very locally based struggles, but the Via Campesina did not conceptualize food sovereignty in isolation. And for the Via Campesina, nor does food sovereignty function in isolation. It's really a mistake to read food sovereignty as this kind of local global binary. Instead, food sovereignty recognizes what Doreen Massey has called a global sense of place that recognizes that the global and the local are rarely separable. It is these connections through which La Via Campesina sought to construct a different world. And it's very clear to the Via Campesina that food sovereignty meant working hard at building relations of solidarity within the movement and also building alliances across sectors and working at different scales, the local, the regional, the national, the international, the global. By introducing food sovereignty, the Via Campesina was taking all these local and national struggles and transforming them really into a transnational organized politics for system change. This is what food sovereignty is all about. And this suggests that food sovereignty goes beyond food and agriculture. It suggests that food sovereignty means looking at the world and being in the world in different ways. Can I have the next slide, please? And this brings me to the second case of food sovereignty in action. And here I want to focus on, um, on part of the definition of food sovereignty that seems less well known, and yet it's absolutely critical. And that is, back in 2007, as the Via Campesina and those gathered at the Neleni Forum stated, and I quote, food sovereignty means constructing new social relations that are free of oppression and inequality between men and women, peoples, racial groups, social and economic classes, and generations. Now, this aspect of food sovereignty clearly indicates that it is a lot more than just about food and agriculture. And this, I think, is, demonstrates its revolutionary potential. We get a sense of this by looking at the work done within the Via Campesina concerning the gender relations, um, the gender relations between uh, within the Via Campesina, uh, and and this has become such so central to the Via Campesina's practice of food sovereignty. So, how exactly is the Via Campesina attempting to reach the goal of women's equality, women's e equity? And how is this informing its conceptualizing, conceptualization and practice of food sovereignty? Well, in the research that I'm doing with uh, Rita, Dr. Rita Calvario in Coimbra uh, University in Portugal, by analyzing the Via Campesina documents over time, we've found that the movement's attempts to dismantle unequal gender relations have meant addressing at least four gender-oriented demands and that these are integral to the movement's politics of food sovereignty. So in efforts to change unequal gender relations within the movement and beyond, the Via Campesina has concentrated on 
ensuring women's equitable access to and control over productive resources and social rights. Um, guaranteeing uh, women's equal participation in agrarian, rural and food politics. They've concentrated on ending all forms uh, of violence against women and also they're focusing on constructing new gender relations. And as someone who attended, um, who has attended every one of the Via Campesina's international conferences, I can attest that for the Via Campesina, food sovereignty has come to include these demands as a largely as a result of the hard collective work, innovative strategies and persistence of women within the movement. Now we get a good sense of how the Via Campesina connects gender, feminisms and food sovereignty by examining the declarations of the women's assemblies, the youth assemblies, and the international conferences of the Via Campesina um, that have occurred uh, be, um, between 1996 to 2017. So can I have the next slide, please? So a close reading of these documents uh, reveals that feminist work within um, the Via Campesina has been incremental, uh, yet very powerful. Starting from when the Via Campesina was first formed, the first action plan coming out of its you know, founding conference in Mons, Bel Belgium, it did recognize men and women's right, equal rights to land, women's important roles in peasant organizations, and also it recognized the need for, to guarantee women's full participation. But even though women represented 20% of the conference delegates at that meeting, only men were elected as leaders. And women peasants or farmers are mentioned only once in the resulting Mons declaration. And no mechanism was established to ensure greater participation of women. So it was only um, since the second and third international conferences of the Via Campesina that the, that the movement took concrete actions in attempts to effectively integrate women and gender issues more fully into the movement and um, its politics. So let me explain what happened uh, at those two conferences because they really are critical in that they fundamentally shaped women's inter in integration into the movement. So at the second international conference uh, held in Taxcala, women delegates pushed the Via Campesina to take concrete action to address gender inequalities. Women were particularly concerned that the movement develop a mechanism, some, you know, some ways that could best ensure women's increased participation and representation. And what they ended up doing was agreeing on the formation of a special committee only composed of women, whose work was to develop a plan of action and, you know, and also um, be key in establishing coordination and communication ties among women around the world. So the next slide. So um, I want to stress here that women did not consider this committee as an end in and of itself. They rejected the idea of kind of ghettoizing women's struggles they did not see themselves as a women's auxiliary to the movement. Instead, women saw the formation of a women's only space as one strategy through which women's concerns and interests could be integrated into the Via Campesina's discourse, into their demands and actions. And the Women's Committee also you know, did a number of things. They promoted the organization of women's meetings immediately prior to major international events, where, whenever and wherever the Via Campesina delegations uh, convened. Uh, they decided to organize international women's assemblies to occur right before each one of the larger, all-encompassing Via Campesina international conferences. And these international conferences only occur every four years. They're the highest political decision-making spaces within the, the movement. And it was really... Uh, ...India in 2000 that the movement made substantially 
important uh, advances in guaranteeing women's political participation within the movement. And what they, they did that by changing the organizational structure of the movement to introduce gender parity in the leadership positions. The Vietnamcina, as a result of the Women's Assembly, approved unanimously that the Vietnamcina's International Coordinating Committee would double in size to ensure that 50% of its regional coordinators were women. So in each region, one man and one woman uh, were elected as regional coordinators. They are the first, the only uh, transnational movement that I know of uh, that has done this. So can I get to uh, the next slide, please? So I, this slide just provides you, you know, provides some glimpses into the kinds of demands that women were making uh, as a result of the women's assemblies. And I just want to stress here that the strategy, you know, the strategy of creating only women's only spaces has been absolutely uh, critical, instrumental in helping construct solidarity among peasant women uh, in the movement. Uh, and, and the positions and strategies that you see here um, have had a significant impact. Uh, and we can see this impact by looking carefully at the Via Campesina's various declarations. Um, and, and, and you can see that women's in, um, issues um, have, are now front and center. Um, and this has was very, very clear. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I'll just uh, give you one example here. Um, in 2008, as a result of, deliberation, of deliberations uh, at the fifth international conference, um, the, the, the Via Campesina's Maputo declaration stated um, that they were um, starting a global campaign to end um, violence against women. And I just want to Am I still here? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. Somebody was trying to call me on my phone. Um, so I just wanted to point here that, um, you know, this quote, if we do not advance against women in our movement, we will not advance in our struggles. And if we do not create new gender relations, we will not be able to build a new society. So I'm, I'm realize that I'm running out of time. So um, I'm just gonna ask that uh, you move the slide to, um, let me just see here. Um, to, the, to the next one, please. To also to the next one. There. Okay, um, you know, I've, I've given you lots of various definitions and, and you've seen that, um, you know, it, it, the definition has changed um, of, of food sovereignty has changed, it's evolved. And I think that um, th this quote from Elizabeth Mofu, who is the general coordinator of the Via Campesina, provides some really important insights into why it is that the, you know, you see some changes, some con constant changes in what food sovereignty means um, around the world. And she says, um, you know, some academics and analysts were concerned that the Via Campesina seems to have a new and different definition of food sovereignty after every meeting and forum. Maybe they think this reflects a lack of seriousness on our part, but that would be a misunderstanding. We are not trying to create a perfect definition um, for a dictionary or for a history book. We are trying to build a movement to change the food system and the world. To build a powerful movement, you need to add more allies. And as you add more allies, you have more voices, more contributions, more issues to take into account. So your concept grows, it evolves, it broadens. Food sovereignty is a vision 
of the food system we are fighting for. But above all, it is an ever-evolving banner of struggle. And I think um, I'll just end by saying that clearly, um, I hope I have been able to communicate that uh, food sovereignty is about changing the food and agriculture system, absolutely. Um, but it is also a, about the other thing in this world and pre predominantly changing social relations. So I, I thank you for, for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please, um, please direct them to me. <laughs> thank you so very much. I certainly did not have appreciation for the issues and what food sovereignty actually meant until you explain that so so great so, so thank you very much for for all that you've done and for your involvement in that movement it's uh, i'm truly inspired by what you do and how you contribute to that uh we we do have a few questions that have started to come through uh, and i encourage everyone to uh to go to slido uh to ask more questions but if i could ask uh for the first few questions to come up they can be made a little bit bigger please so we're able to read them if that's possible Uh, maybe a little bit bigger. <laughs> Super, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so the first question is because food sovereignty is so intertwined with gender equality, how have feminist movements like Me Too impacted the food sovereignty movement? That's, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, and, and I, I had a lot more to say about feminism <laughs> and food sovereignty, but I, I, I saw that I was running out of time. Um, I, I'm not sure that the Me Too movement has has affected. Um, it, sorry, was the question how is how has feminism or feminist movements impacted food sovereignty or the movement? It was uh, because food sovereignty is so intertwined with gender equality, how have feminist movements like Me Too impacted the food sovereignty movement? Okay. Um, well, that's interesting because a lot of, um, uh, there's been quite some debate recently about whether or not food sovereignty is feminist. Um, and I think that that's, that's certainly why uh, Dr. Rita Calvario and I um, have have you know really wanted to dig into this this question uh, of the the links between feminism and food sovereignty because there really wasn't very much research um, demonstrating uh, those you know the feminist issues that that were being raised within the movement and um, one of the things that was uh, obvious in the work that we've done is that urban based feminist movements, um, you know, have, have, have been active internationally for, for, for some, for some time. I mean, you know, since the UN dec uh, decade of women, and I can't remember exactly when that was, that was quite some time ago, but since then there's been like, there have been global connections made um, between women's movements, uh, you know, for years, decades, mm -hmm. but rural women were were not really. I mean, there's always been some, excuse me, some discrimination, um, you know. Be, be, the, in the, there's been some discrimination uh, of rural women in that you know often. Um, they are thought of as being more backward, um, you know, et cetera. And so there's been a kind of a separation between the urban and the rural. And, and I think that food sovereignty has helped build, you know, stronger ties um, among w women. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot of discussion that takes place now um, between uh, urban-based women and rural women. And I think that that's led to a much stronger um, it, 
but the women um, and so i think i'll i'll leave it at that <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, another question we've had been asked is how has COVID impacted communities ability and capacity to work towards or achieve food sovereignty? That, uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, a, a global movement like the Vilcapsina that depended so much on um, being able to meet face to face, you know, being able to cross borders, these long, long exchanges between organizations from, you know, between various regions in the world. Of course, COVID put a complete stop to all of that. So it was very interesting um, to, you know, to see, well, okay, how is, how, how is the Via Campesina going to survive? And they have, uh, they have become um, increasingly visible, uh, actually. Um, you know, they, there's, if you go to their website, you'll see that they have been able to continue to um, mobilize interests and, and around food sovereignty in very, very innovative ways. Um, and, I, and I think part of it is that as a result of COVID, there you know, food, the food system, parts of the global food system have been put in question. I mean, you know, food wasn't um, uh, going across food, across borders as easily as it had been before. There were um, breaks in the, in the traditional conventional um, food chain in that uh, meat packing plants were closed down because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so all of that actually led a lot of people around the world to start thinking about local food and how important it is to, to be able to source your food more locally. Um, so there's been a lot of, um, it, it, you know, a lot more interest in, in small scale agriculture. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, I, it's been also very devastating in some parts of the world, if, you know, of course. I mean, you know, places like India are, are being just, uh, it's tragic, tragic what's happening uh, as a result of COVID. But, but they're, they're surviving. Um, and, and they're, as a movement, they're, they've, they've been able to do a, a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what you were saying uh, about that makes me think about um, last spring, we had two, two of our professors, one in Astor School of Business and one in, in the Faculty of Agriculture, talk about the effects of supply chain management of food during COVID. And I remember just in the media about this time last year, talking a lot about potatoes and the amount of potatoes that are used, particularly in the restaurant industry and, and the effects of that in certain countries who are exporting and growing potatoes and whatnot. But it really does, it's it's very interesting over this last year, how, um, as you're saying, you know, that the trade and, and of, 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 of the food industry and, and what's gone on. So definitely some impacts also in the movement that you're, that you're, uh, that you're mentioning. So as we just wait for some more questions to come through, can you share with us, you know, now that we are where we are, what do you think is next for La, La Via Campesina? Like, where do you think is, you know, there, there's, you know, from conferences, the next few conferences, and you're talking about the iteration of the definitions, if you will, where do you see, you know, 2022 from now, where, where will the organization be? Well, I think one of the most important um, one of the most in parts of their work is going to constantly help and shun drop the creation of the rights of peasants uh, actually is embraced by different countries and and how that's going to be implemented because. You know, they now have, um, and, and it's remarkable, actually really remarkable that they've been able to get uh, an international declaration of the rights of peasants and those working in rural areas uh, passed at the UN level. And, and you know, that that's how, you know, 
human rights it started a, a long time ago as a as a vision of what we want to see in the world and it's something that we continue to strive to put in to implement uh, so i think that that's going to be a really important part of what the via campesina does and i know in canada uh, the two organizations that are part of the via campesina are, are going to be working on trying to see how canada you know what can, what does this mean for changing food systems in canada if if we now have a un declaration that you know, that the that, that food sovereignty. Do you think that all countries will adopt that UN declaration? Like how smooth will that, that be, uh, you know, around the world, knowing what you know in various different parts of the world? <laughs> no, it's, it will take, um, uh, it, 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 <laughs> it's going to be a real, Uh, because you know some countries that have, that uh, said no uh, to this uh, the, the passing of this at the uh, UN level, uh, you know were the countries in the developed world: Canada, the U.S., Australia, uh, some countries in Europe, uh, etc. And that's because they they are the ones who are. Um, uh, who, 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 you know, who drive the, the global food system um, that, you know, focus scale agriculture production um, in, in the also it's going to take um, a lot to change um, the way of thinking, um, but I think climate change is also going to have a really fundamental impact on how we think about our agricultural systems. Um, and you know, it's clear that we need to do something different. We can't we can't continue to you know allow uh, for climate change to even get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. No, excellent point. Um, and what is next for you in terms of your research? Well, I really would like to uh, get back to Europe um, <laughs> so that because one of the things that one piece of research that I'm involved in uh, with some colleagues at Coventry University uh, and uh, Coimbra in Portugal is looking at the gender dimensions of uh, food sovereignty in Europe. Um, and so we're working with three different Uh, as, a, as a starting point, and then hopefully we'll be able to expand that reach to include other countries. So I'm very anxious to uh, be able to, to continue uh, on that research. I'm also involved in um, looking at changing land tenure patterns here in um, on the prairies, um, because the way you hold land, you know, if you, it helps determine the model of agriculture that you will use. So we're very concerned about just how big farms are getting. Uh, we're also very concerned about um, how investors are, are purchasing land. And the big problem is that it, that's all making uh, food, uh, land less available for young people to farm. And so we need to be able to have an, you know, the next generation of farmers. And so we need to think about how are we going to change land legislation so that it makes it easier for young people to get into farming? Mm -hmm. All great, great points and great research. So I, I wish you good luck for that. And we'll have to bring you back another time because that sounds fascinating. I'd love to hear about all of that. And hopefully you will be able to get to Europe very soon so you're able to uh, continue to, to connect with colleagues and do your research. So I'll put one last call if there, anybody has any questions uh, for Dr. Demaray. Don't know if there's any more questions. Okay, so with that, thank you so very much uh, for that really interesting uh, and compelling presentation. A lot of information that I know for, for myself, I did not know. I'm sure our audience did, did not as well. Um, so everybody who participated today, thank you very much for being here. We will send you a link as I mentioned. Uh, and for those of us, uh, for those of you who didn't have any questions, you can continue to send some questions and maybe we'll uh, be able to get some feedback from you, um, Dr. Demare, if, uh, if, uh, if there's any last questions that uh, we're not able to be asked.
Um, and everybody who's participating, just our very last session for the spring is in two days. So this week was great that we had two virtual learning for life sessions. Uh, we have Dr. Jones with us on Wednesday, who will be speaking on the topic of public health history and pandemic planning, the Royal Society of Canada COVID-19 task force. So if you haven't registered for that yet, I encourage you to do that. Please go to our website. You'll see all the details there. You can register there. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day and hopefully we will see you on Wednesday.